Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanggang Namasami. <coughs> I'd like to start by, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I'd like to start by offering my greetings to everyone this morning. Um, <coughs> it's nice to see such a, a large group out. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, one of the things um, I've noticed over the years of um, spending so many years practicing and so many years living in the monastery as a monk is um, how the way you understand certain teachings or relate to certain teachings or the importance you give certain teachings changes over the years. So, um, you know, you can see it, for example, when you read the suttas. When you come back and read the suttas again after a few years, um, you'll start to see things that you didn't see before. You'll um, start to understand teachings in a different way. And, um, and one of the, the teachings for me that has really changed uh, my understanding of it and the importance I see in it over the years is this uh, teaching on parami. So, um, <coughs> Um, I don't really know much about Buddhism in the West, but um, uh, Barami is a very big uh, concept in Thai, in Thai culture, not just in Thai monasticism. Um, but a lot of times it's misunderstood. So Barami, these are uh, usually translated as the perfections, but these are these 10 spiritual qualities or these personality traits or these like personal qualities that um, allow us to practice to become enlightened. So they're dana barmi, or our generosity, sila barmi, our moral conduct, nekama barmi, which is our uh, renunciation, panya barmi, which is wisdom, wirya barmi, which is effort or energy, kanti barmi, which is patience or patient endurance, um, sacha barmi, which is our usually translated as truthfulness, but I prefer honesty. Um, <clears throat> Aditana Barmi, which is our determination or resolution. Metta Barmi, which is loving kindness. And Upeka Barmi, which is equanimity. And I'm pretty sure I got them all. Might have, <laughs> might have missed a few. But, um, but so um, a lot of times um, uh, these are very misunderstood or not given any importance. So a lot of times, um, a lot of scholars will uh, just outright disregard this list because um, it never appears, this list never appears together in the text. It's not in the Tipitaka. Um, the, different, uh, the different qualities are found in different places in the Tipitaka, but it never appears together as a list like this. And it's also um, usually uh, uh, connected with the Bodhisattva's uh, path to enlightenment. So when before he became the Buddha, when he was the Bodhisattva, he was perfecting each of these Barmis. Um, because there's three different levels of Barmis. There's the normal level, there's the next level up, which is called like Upa Barmi, and then there's highest level, which is called like Paramata Barmi. So the Bodhisattva was trying to perfect them to the level of Paramata Barmi. There's also um, a lot of misunderstandings in Thai culture itself about Barmi. So a lot of times it gets, um, uh, when it's used, it's more meant as like your accumulation of merit or certain merits you've accumulated. So, you know, if say people offer me a lot of coffee, uh, people will be like, oh, he's got a lot of coffee bar me because he's getting a lot of coffee. But but uh, yeah, there's there's no coffee in the uh, list of bar me's. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, or a lot of times it's, uh, um, it's equated to uh, worldly success, so with gain, position, wealth. So, you know, a lot of times the people will talk and say if someone's very rich, they'll be like, oh, wow, he's got a lot of barmi. Or if someone's very famous, oh, wow, they've got a lot of barmi. 
But again, that's not how we use them in practice. We use them specifically with these qualities um, which are gonna help us, we develop, and are gonna help us in our practice. And the longer I've stayed a monk and watching it myself and watching in other people, the more important I've seen these qualities and developing these qualities and having these qualities. So all of us do have all of these barmis and all of these qualities, but we're gonna have them to different extents. Certain ones we're gonna be stronger at, other ones we're gonna be weaker at. And, um, um, and you can see it in people around you. Um, it's usually easier to see things in other people than it is to see in ourselves. Like you can see there's some people who are just like for Donna Barmi are just naturally generous. You know, it's very easy for them to give, they love to give. And then you can see with other people, um, they're not, it's very difficult for them to give. Even if they have a lot, it's difficult for them to practice generosity. Or with sila barmi, or morality, you know, we see some people who just have this like natural sense of sila to them. You know, like I know some people who just, you know, from, from basically the time they were born, you know, they couldn't lie to save their lives, you know, or they couldn't harm anything, couldn't harm a fly. And then other people, you know, to actually keep sila, to keep the five precepts, you actually have to put in a lot of effort and you have to really restrain ourselves. So again, just difference in barmi, or for example, nekama barmi. You see this one a lot in the, in the monastery, living at Wat Panana Chat, <coughs> especially when it comes to hair. Because um, you see, uh, at Wat Panana Chat, we have this, this standard that um, when men stay there for over a certain period of time, they have to, uh, have to shave their heads. Uh, women don't have to, but um, the men do. And you'll see some men, you know, they might have long hair. Uh, I've seen ones where, you know, they've got long dreadlocks, which they've been, you know, growing out for years and taking care of for years. No problem, you know, they're just like, yep, yeah, shave it off. I want to stay in the monastery. Then you see other people, even if they have quite short hair, just, they just can't do it. They can't give up their hair uh, and grows back pretty quick too. And, um, and they, uh, they just can't do it. So it's, again, it's a different uh, level of barmy. But these barmies aren't a static, fixed thing. So it's not like if I um, don't, if a barmy I have is weak, it doesn't mean it's always going to be like that. Or if a barmy I have is strong, a personality I have st is strong, it doesn't, it's, it's not always going to be like that. <clears throat> You can think of them more as like, like muscles. You know, we can build up muscles or we can weaken muscles. Um, so the more we work at the, uh, developing these barmies, the stronger they're gonna be. But yeah, but again, like muscles, if we don't work them or if we do something which works against them, they're gonna get weaker. And, um, but, it, but with the same as exercising and building muscle is it takes time. We can't expect them to, uh, to happen overnight, or we can't expect, you know, to do one big, big show of, of, of uh, say for example, generosity, just one big time giving, and then have a very developed dana barmi. You know, it'd be the same as if you wanted big muscles and you go to the gym and you just try to one time lift one really, really heavy weight. You know, it's not going to give you big muscles. It might hurt you in the end. You know. Um, so for us, we we are working on developing these, but we don't have to. Uh, work step by step and say, okay, I'll develop this bar me now, and then I'll develop this one, and then this one, and once I've developed ten, then I can then I can practice. Um, we don't do that like uh, we develop them together and generally while we're practicing. So you'll see in the um, in the when we're living in the monastery, there's a lot of the the practices we do outside of meditation, um, which help us with our meditation practice. So especially when we're new to the monastery, we're always practicing generosity. It's just part of the system. We're developing this generosity bar at me. Um, and uh, when I was living with Lumpur Biak, there was a real focus on this developing bar me. So he had us do this practice of these very, very long chanting sessions. Um, so we chant for about three hours, four hours. And um, it was late at night too. And he would say, this is, you know, you're actually, this is building barmi. You know, you're building your kanti barmi, like your patience. You're building your wiriya barmi, like your effort. And you're building your aditana barmi. And then afterwards, we'd usually have to stay up all night. And with that, he, he was, again, he was saying, you know, you're really building this barmi. He said, even if you don't see the benefit, benefits of it now, you know, uh, later on life or in future lives, you'll see the benefit and it's really beneficial. And even though I didn't want to do it in the beginning, 
I did find it very beneficial um, practicing in that way. And one time I was uh, talking with Lumpur Biak, and we were talking about this practice of doing the chanting. And I was saying, oh, Lumpur, you know, I, to, um, to me, it, it's kind of like monastic cross training. For, for people who don't know, like cross training is like when you have one sport and you do other sports to support that main sport. It's like when I was a kid and a teenager, I used to be a swimmer, but we do um, a couple practices a week in the gym, like. Um, you know, with medicine balls and running and stuff like that, and that would help our swimming. So I was like, Lumpur, yeah, I think it's kind of like, like cross-training for meditation. And he just looked at me, he said, don't think so much. <laughs> but, but, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, so, so this, is, this is a big part of our lives. And um, uh, this time of the year in Thailand, there is a lot of talk about a particular barami, about Aditana barami. So this is our determination, our resolution. So this is um, when we make a, a firm aditana or firm determination to do something, that we do it without breaking it. And the more we strengthen this barmi, the more power in our, in, in our own minds and hearts a uh, determination has. And so you, know, you can see it in other people where you, know, you get those people in life where they, they set their mind to something. They want to do something, and they never stop until they do it. You know, whereas some of us, you know, we, we get really inspired at first, you know, we set our determination and then, you know, we do it a bit and then give up. And, but, but, but building this Aditan Barmi is really important in practice. And in Thailand, again, it's very, this time of the year, it's, it's very talked about because um, in the West, we have this tradition of making New Year's resolutions. But in Thailand, there's a tradition of making Pansa Aditan, so like resolutions for the three months of the rains retreat. Um, I personally think there's a lot of advantages of doing it this way because it has a set time boundary. So, so you have an end goal to it, and it's you know, 90 days. It, it can be quite difficult for certain ones. Um, but whereas when we do New Year's resolutions, it's always a, an open-ended one, and so it, and it's usually to for people to get in shape, and you know, and you know, by March everyone's given up on it already. So, um, so this way it's easier to keep the aditan and not break it. Um, so you'll see in Thailand, there'll be these um, uh, projects, like nationwide projects. There's one called Lurk Lot La. So it's like to give up, to reduce, or to abandon. And it's specifically to get people to sign on to uh, try to give up cigarettes, uh, drinking, and drugs for the three months of the Pansa. Or a number of years ago, they had this big national project. You'd see stickers all over the place for it called Muban Sinha. So it's like a the five precepts village or a neighborhood. So they try to get everyone in their, their village or their neighborhood to agree to keep the five precepts for the whole pansa, and then they'd all put stickers in their cars and stuff for it. And so, um, so this is a, a, a big thing in Thailand this time of the year. And it's very normal for monks to, when they're determining uh, pansa, to determine several uh, aditans, like austere practices for this period. So sometimes it might be just eating what you get on Bindabat. Sometimes it might be, you know, mixing everything in your bowl, never missing a morning uh, morning chanting. You know, something like this. And I remember a number of years ago when I was staying with uh, Ajahn Anand at Wat Mop John, they made this big, big uh, cardboard, like big board, and had everyone's name on it. And they'd put beside you which, which uh, aditans you had for the pansa for everyone to see, to try to help you keep, keep these determinations. Because, you know, if everyone sees that, oh, you know, Nando's uh, only eating what he got on Bindabat today, or only what he got on Bindabat during practice, if, you know, if everyone will know if I go up to the meal line, they'll like, aha, <laughs> broke it, you know. So, um, so, so this is a way we, we, you know, as a community support each other in keeping these aditans. But one of the ways uh, uh, when Ajahn Isra, who's uh, Lumpur Bix, kind of like his right-hand man, his, his most senior disciple and the abbot of his branch monastery, he would really encourage um, to, when you sit meditation, uh, every time you sit meditation, to make the determination um, uh, that you won't get up until you know, your uh, set period is done. So say something like an hour and uh, Lumpur Biak encourages that as well. He said the only exception to get up is diarrhea. Otherwise, otherwise you've got to sit through it, got to keep that, that determination. But, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, um, 
but when we're making these aditans and these determinations, it's really important for us to not go beyond, too far beyond what we're able to do. Because what we want to do is we want to um, really create this, this attitude of mind that when we make a determination, we won't break it. So we do something we can do, maybe pushing us a little bit, but, but not too much, especially in the beginning. So, you know, if you've never sat for more than an hour of meditation, you know, you don't, you don't sit down and make the aditan, you know, I'm going to sit for six hours without getting up because you're probably going to break it. So, um, so it's good to do something that is uh, attainable for us. And then uh, we just keep doing it. You know, you keep doing these um, every time you sit, you make a determination, you know, and, and you can make other little determinations throughout your daily life, you know, maybe for a week, maybe for just, you know, a couple days or, you know, three months of the pansa. And as you do this and you keep pushing yourself a little more, a little more, um, your aditan barami is going gonna, is gonna to strengthen. And then, you know, when you do make bigger aditans, like, you know, say if someone ordains as a monk and they make the aditan, well, I'm never going to disrobe. It has more power to it. But if your your determinations don't have any power, you don't. This mental quality hasn't been developed. Then you make the determination. I'm never going to disrobe. It doesn't really mean anything, right? So, um, so uh, we're kind of a little limited on time today. So I'd maybe like to offer this to everyone as a bit of a reflection this morning. Ah, John. Uh, I ordained at Wat Mop, John, and there was one uh, monk who took on the Aditana for the three month rains retreat. To I think he was fasting six days out of every week and eating one day. And after the Vasa ended, he promptly disrobed and became a cook. <laughs> <laughs> so be wary. <laughs> um, we have a chance now for Q&A. Um, so if people want to raise uh, their hands and uh, wait for a mic person to come over you to you uh, with a mic and just feel free to say your name and um, uh, ask a question, and um, yeah, this is the last day we get Ajahn Nando, so you can direct questions to him. Also, Aya and Anagarika, you can direct questions to them as well. Um, we will have Aya next week as well, and if you're on Zoom, raise your electronic hand, and we hopefully can call on you or type into the chat. Ajahn Nando, I'm interested in, in your early years of monasticism, what was your biggest challenge? And then now, what's the biggest challenge of your spiritual practice? Um, in the, right in the very beginning, so when I first entered the monastery, um, for me it was loneliness. You know, I was very shy and I was very lonely. I'd been someone who had very social, had a very uh, tight group of friends, very close with my family, and then going to a place where I was, you know, not really talking to anyone and just on my own and also just kind of coming down from the lay life so you know everything was I was very active I was very busy I was always doing stuff and then you know the mind kind of almost kind of going through like a bit of a detox you know and and calming down so that was that was very difficult in the beginning um, now the most difficult thing is it's f physical you know I, I uh, broke my knee and so um, a number of years ago so I went from being able to do very, very long sits to now maybe an hour and I have to change postures. So that, that's been one of the, the most difficult things. I was just recently, af after I broke my knee, I was uh, chair bound, had, couldn't sit on the floor for about two and a half years. So it was, um, yeah, that's, that's definitely kind of the biggest, biggest obstacle to me right now. And also, what, how did you, uh, what was the antidote to curing the loneliness? What was the antidote to that? I, I think the, the, it was just um, getting used to it, because a lot of the times, I remember Ajahn Chitamala was saying to us once, you know, in the beginning, you really have to endure being by yourself, but over time, you really learn to enjoy being by yourself. So again, it's kind of as, as you know, the mind gets used to not having constant Im, uh, stimu uh, stimulation, constant input, you know, when you get uh, um, used to all this time by yourself, and then, you know, as, as the shyness and stuff, uh, got better and you start making more and more friends at the monastery and talking more um, that loneliness got a lot better but again it's, it's just one of these things you just um, you just over time it gets better and you get over it you know uh, 
Uh, those online, uh, Daniel, and then after that, Mary. And how it relates to, I'm sorry? Uh, you were muted, sorry, Daniel, can you start again? I have a question, can you hear me? We can now, yes, uh, if you start Great. again, we can we can go for it. Yes, I'm wondering about how attention relates to intention. Um, when I read Wings to Awakening, I think there was some um, mention of kind of an interrelationship between the two. And I've been thinking about how when I don't take into consideration the wants and needs of others, my good intention kind of falls short. Um, you know, if I assume that everyone wants the same exact things that I want and I have good intentions toward everyone and give them what I want, then sometimes they're not happy. Um, and I was recently reading the Sadaka Sutta about the acrobats and there's the line about how to make oneself, uh, how to look after oneself by looking after others. And there are four qualities. There's, um, Awihimsa, Metta Chitta, um, I have it right here. Avihimsa, Metta Chitta, Kanti, and um, an Anudayata. And, or excuse me, it says Anudayata, yeah, but that might just be the polygrammer. And I'm wondering, because I'm seeing some different uh, translations of this as sympathy, forbearance, but also as consideration. And I'm wondering what consideration means to you in terms of looking after others. Um, it's not a fully formed question, but if you could, if you could share that, would be appreciated. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, maybe with with the beginning part, like you were. So there was kind of a few questions in there. So the first about the relationship between intention, attention and intention, correct? And so um, uh, I think a lot of that is, you know, attention, like say having, having mindfulness when you're, when you're doing something. Because a lot of times, you know, if we don't have the mindfulness there, um, we're not always, you know, we're just not aware of what our intentions are. And, you know, we're not sometimes not being honest about what our intentions are. And so when we do have... Uh, a good amount of mindfulness there, we can kind of actively take control of what our intentions are. Because it's very easy to, you know, um, uh, tell ourselves or, or convince ourselves at the time or afterwards what uh, what our intention was. And it's not, not always very accurate. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I, I, I said this to this person, you know, maybe you said some kind of like harsh comment to someone. And it's like, well, I, I said that to help them, you know. And it's like, well... If you're really honest, it's not. I said it to hurt them, you know, and um, or I said it to make myself feel better. So it looks like I know something they don't, you know, and so um, so yeah, I think I think yeah, having having that uh, real mindfulness and really trying to actively bring up and be aware of what kind of uh, intentions we have um, when we do that. Daniel, would you mind rephrasing the, the final part of the question? Is it how you look after others and uh, oneself and the relationship between uh, consideration and kind of paying attention to others' needs in terms of showing compassion for them? Or Yeah. Um, I'm asking about how my consideration for others and my attention for the needs of others um, can impact the way I perform good intention. So basically, um, how your consideration and attentiveness to others' conditions and needs informs your own urge to help them and kind of when there's an imbalance there or how to harmonize those two so that you're intentions to help another aren't simply kind of an expression of something that's actually going to be damaging or not helpful? Maybe? Right, because it seems almost like an impure good intention if I say, may you be happy and here's all the things that I'm going to do to try to make you happy. 
without taking into consideration the things that would actually make someone um, happy or, or without taking into consideration how their needs might relate Okay, so um, uh, in one sutta, the Buddha was talking about um, uh, there was this lady came and she offered a single sewing need needle to the monks while they were um, sewing robes. And the Buddha was saying how in a past life he had gone and he had offered, you know, just so much stuff to the monks, all this gold, all like tons and tons of stuff to the monk monks, but he said that this lady had actually made more merit from offering this one sewing needle to the monks than he had made in a past life from offering all that stuff to the monks um, because what she was offering was actually what was needed at the time. So, be, so it was more meritorious for her offering what was needed than offering a lot of stuff which, which wasn't needed at the time. So you know, when, when you are uh, giving and helping people out, it is important to know what's helping them out or how to help them out. You know, and so uh, don't don't let that discourage you from being from helping people out or discourage you from um, trying to do what's best for other people. But um, but just just yeah, really be aware of their needs, and also um, be aware that we can't always help people. Sometimes you know we see people who are suffering, we see people who are having a difficult time, and we really want to help them and we want to do everything and we want to help everybody, but sometimes we just can't. So, you know, Mei Chi Gao, um, this uh, uh, nun, she was a disciple of Lung Parman and Lung Tam Mahabua, and, um, and she had this quote, you know, uh, you can't grow enough grass to thatch every roof in the village. So she was saying, you know, you have to learn how to give within your means. So, yeah, so even though, you know, we always want to fix everyone else's problems and we don't want them to suffer, we, we can't always do it. Mary. Thank you, Ajahn. Greetings, all. Um, my question is to you, Ajahn Nando. I'm glad to see your recovery from your knee injury, but at the time of the acute injury and the pain, I'm wondering what practices you use to deal with pain in a skillful manner. Thank you. <clears throat> Luckily, with a, uh, a broken knee, a lot of times if you just immobilize it, it's uh, it's not too bad. But um, uh, a lot of just, just really, really um, having mindfulness, really putting effort into the, the meditation practice. So it was one of these things that um, even though even though it was broken and I, I had a lot of physical pain, actually like emotionally the whole thing was not that bothersome at all in the initial part, like initially after breaking it, because it kind of gave, gives you something to work against. Like you've got this, this thing here, and you have to have to bring up your practice because you can't walk, you can't go anywhere. So you have to be really, um, really watch your apanika dhammas, not overeating, not oversleeping, because um, you can't do anything to shake off if tiredness comes or if your mindfulness is there. And you know, you, there's no boredom because you know you've got this thing. You know, you always have to be mindful. You know, if you do a sudden movement, it's going to hurt. So even though like physically it was tough, it um. Yeah, it was uh, emotionally fine, you know, and, and the practice was pushed, was, it really uh, forced me to up my practice. But, um, but it's more the long term, which, which became more difficult and just, you know, not being able to do the stuff that, um, that I did before. Like, cause you know, I was, uh, I was only maybe like 31 when I did it. And you know, before I was quite fit. I remember maybe about six months beforehand, a year beforehand, Ajahn Sadaro, who's been here before and I were building a kuti and you know to to do the work on the roof and stuff like i was climbing up it like a little monkey and now it's like i just can't do that i've got kind of got got the old man now on, sitting on the ground get someone else to do it so um so there's there's uh the adjusting to the changes like that are what's more difficult thank you ellen here uh, welcome to all of you. I'm so happy to have a room full of fellow Canadians, particularly a fellow Winnipegger, which is where I was born and bred. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I listened to your YouTube talk with Ajahn Nisipo. I think it was a Wednesday. I'm not sure, a couple of days ago anyway. 
and appreciated what you said about public speaking, not one of my favorite things, and this is the first, so here I go. I hope I can remember my question. <laughs> I, I think it piggybacks onto maybe what Daniel asked. You talked about uh, the honesty, is it para me or bear me? Par me, par me. Par me, okay. You talked about the honesty, which is uh, knowing what works for you. I think I'm, I'm misquoting, I'm sure, but knowing what works for you, knowing what's good in your practice, and then maybe discarding. You might have said something like that about what's not working. And I wonder how you balance that with the, what you just talked about, about persistence, determination, how you balance those two, sticking with it when you're in doubt. Mm -hmm. I can't relate, but anyway, when you're in doubt sometimes, working through the doubt to do what's working for you. Um, yeah, so it does all, all relate together. So for example, with um, the putting forth the effort and getting a balance with that, yeah, we, we really have to, that, that's a really important one because sometimes you know, we can um, try to push ourselves too hard, you know, and, and you know, like either externally like sit longer than we can or you know or um or you know not get enough sleep or not get enough to eat and um <laughs> and uh and so so sometimes we can do it that way but it can also be like internally when we're putting um putting forth effort so you know we're meditating and we're trying too hard we're forcing too hard to watch the breath when we actually need to maybe pull back a bit work on relaxing a bit because you know in practice it is it is really this like this balancing act and, and this kind of almost like an artistic dance to get, you know, that middle way. And, you know, there's always a constant uh, adjusting and changing. So sometimes, you know, we, um, uh, we do need to put forth a little more effort. Sometimes we need, need, need to pull back a little bit. And so being honest with ourselves about that. And a lot of times it, it is from trial and error. But, you know, because sometimes we, we may feel like, yeah, I should, I should be going harder. I want to become enlightened. I should be going harder. Um, but then just, you know, being honest and, uh, and being like, okay, actually going harder isn't what I need right now or it's not working for me right now. And, um, but be open to that it's going to change. So, so you know, you, you may go through some periods where you really do push a lot harder and other periods where you pull back a bit. I um thank you Ajahn. I um just quickly we uh, have a bit more time um and we might be able to come back to general Q&A but I did want to we don't know exactly how long we get uh Anagarika Tracy with us uh seeing as she's running back to Australia which is a long way away. So um uh Anagarika Tracy would you feel up to just telling us about why you're in white right now and what your pathway has been to where you are what inspired you um great let's get put on a mic when you're away from your home monastery <laughs> but it's fine I appreciate the opportunity um it's First of all, very nice to see such a large group of people and so many of you keeping the five precepts. That was just very inspiring. Um, and for me, I, I think a few years ago, I would not have known what the five precepts were at all. And um, I really can't explain. There's, there's no satisfying explanation for why I'm in white. Um, <laughs> but it was very much just... Um, Thinking back to when I was a kid, I just wanted to volunteer. I just wanted to volunteer all the time. And I, in high school, you know, you're thinking about what career do you want? And I was like, I, I don't know that I understand working. Why can't I just volunteer instead? And another strange thing when I was in high school was I thought, okay, where would I want to live? And I just thought, I want to live in a forest. I want to live in a very small building that's just big enough, no bigger than it needs to be. And, um, and I, and I was even not one who was, had any affinity for religion, other than that some of my close friends who inspired me a lot, they, they happened to be Christians, um, but it didn't, it wasn't something that I inclined to. Um, and then I heard a talk by Ajahn Brahm, and that, that kind of did it. Um, uh, I, I, eventually made it over to Australia, to Damasara in 2018 for the first time. 
um, I met the community there and got to see how they live in the forest. And I thought, well, this, this is exactly what I wanted to do. I just have to figure out what this being a nun thing is. So since 2018, I've, I've just asked questions and, and learned a lot from the nuns there. Um, kept listening to the teachings by Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Brahmali, and it, it just made so much sense to me. It was, it was, I guess, before I came across Buddhism, there were like, life happens and you're trying to figure out, well, how, how do I deal with life? And I, I just had trouble finding any answers. Um, eventually, I somehow figured out some things that made sense to me, and it's like, wow, okay, um, this is great, but where, where do I find more? And, and I couldn't really find any answers until I came across Buddhism. Um, and so it's just finding a really cool community at Damasara and enjoying the lifestyle there. And it wasn't that I said, oh, no, like, I want to be a nun. Um, it was more just, do I want to stay for three months? Yes, I'll apply for that. And do I want to stay and serve the community for a year? Yes. And so I just tried that out. And, and then towards the end of that year, I said, do you want to try being a novice? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and so it's just one step at a time. And what's the uh, greatest challenge you've had so far? And what's the greatest gift of the two? Um, so what's the greatest challenge so far? And what's the greatest gift? Um, uh, there's no shortage of challenges. And and I think it's you, you get surprised at what things challenge you. Um, I guess for me especially, um, I'd been working, um, I had a concussion some time ago and so I was working from home already quite a bit so I was very much in my own space and not interacting much with people in person and so then you land at Damasara and you have people coming every day, you have overnight visitors a lot and so it was just the sheer amount of interacting with people um, that I had to adjust to, um, but it all, that also turned into the greatest gift in that now I'm supported in this place 24-7 to just apply the Dhamma and, and any time any challenge came up, like the next person I saw in brown, I could ask, hey, can you help me with this? And they would have something to offer to me or, and then I could also ask someone else in brown and they would have something different to offer to me. And so it's just been such a treat to be able to really try to put all these tools into practice that you're learning 24-7. And I just love that I have this opportunity to support so many fully ordained bhikkhunis. Um, even, even when I'm not doing well there, I can, like, if I can crawl out of the room, there's something small that, and tangible that I can do for someone. Um, and to be able to help all the nuns keep the rules that they've undertaken is just so inspiring to me. Thank you. We have time for another two questions. Ajahnando, following up on one of the comments you made about um, you broke your knee and you weren't able to sit on the floor and had to sit in a chair, how much does that matter, really? How you, the position you use to meditate? I, I can't sit on a floor for, for very long. I do fine in a chair. Does it matter and then what's, what's the quality of the difference? Um, um, it, uh, you can sit in any posture. You can sit in a chair, you can sit on the floor. But as um, monastics, as monks in Thailand, we're always on the floor. So, you know, we, we eat our meals sitting on the floor. You know, we um, do our paddy mocha, like recitation of rules on the floor. We have our tea on the floor. So everything you're doing is always on the floor. And um, when you show up and you have to like bring a chair with you and everywhere you go, you gotta kind of carry this chair around and put it there. And, and you know, normally, you know, we'd sitting like this and then all of a sudden I'm sitting up above everyone else. And, um, you know, when senior monks come and, you know, we pay respects to them, you know, they're on the floor and I'm up on a chair, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a little awkward. And, um, yeah, but you can meditate in any posture, you know, sitting, you know, lying down. Lying down, you know, you can sometimes fall asleep, but, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, no chair is perfectly fine to meditate in. 
Yeah. Right. There, there's a difference between the monastics and the lay people in that respect. Then. Yeah, and especially living in um, Thailand versus living in the West. So um, after I, I um, had recovered enough from my, my accident, I actually went to go live in a monastery in Australia for a while because it was much more suited to being able to sit on, the, uh, on chairs and stuff. And so, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So uh, I understand the uh, importance of being inspired by the power maze. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, uh, it, it, this is about that balance when you're not pushing yourself too much, efforting too much, and then you just allowing uh, and accepting what difficulties comes up in your practice. Uh, it's been a little bit of my own experience is, for some reason, some paramis just come up by themselves after I've done that. So I'm wondering if you have anything to say about that. So um, uh, with the, um, uh, the, the, the balance and when difficulties are coming up in practice, you know, um, initially one of the main things is you, you just have to accept this. Difficulties are always going to come up in practice. You know, you even hear um, uh, a lot of like the great like legendary forest monks of of the last century, and and they had heaps of difficulties. You know, so it's um, um, so one don't get don't get upset with yourself. Don't get angry like oh why is this happening to me? Why is this coming up? Um, but uh, but for finding the balance about like. Um, but when these difficult, sorry, when these difficulties come up, you know, um, you have to accept that they're there, but you still, you, you know, you work through them. So it's not, I accept this difficulty is here. Like say, for example, if you're getting sleepy and falling asleep while meditating, you know, first, okay, you have to accept that you're getting sleepy. Don't get frustrated, angry at yourself, but find a way to deal with the sleepiness. Don't just be like, okay, I get sleepy when I meditate. So every time you sit and meditate, you fall asleep, right? So you, you accept that there are these problems and difficulties, but then you work at uh, overcoming them. And for finding the balance between pushing too hard and not enough, a, a lot of that's gonna be trial and error. You're gonna see when you're not pushing hard enough and, and then you're gonna see when you're, you're um, pushing too hard and you just, you try to find that balance. And then the more you get familiar with it and you'll start noticing yourself, say, pushing too hard, and right when you, the more, the quicker you can notice that, you can be, okay, okay, pull back. Or you'll notice yourself getting a little too slack. Okay, okay, maybe bring it up a bit. But yeah, it's just gonna, it's gonna come with, uh, with consistent practice, you know, and really watching that. Thank you, Ajahn, for all the uh, answers in the talk as well. Um, and just to uh, really appreciate uh, Anagarika, Tracy's uh, interweaving of those you can see the relationship between renunciation barmi and giving barmi in, in what she spoke about how you know whenever things appeared difficult or dry there was this recollection of what she could give and just uh, yeah just to recollect as a community what a gift it is to see someone taking this step and we wish you all the best and please come and visit us more um, in these coming weeks really